My name is Samantha Blakan, and I am the Humanities Research Lead for Zooniverse. I'm typically based at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, though I am currently working from home while our institution is temporarily closed due to COVID-19. I'm sorry we couldn't all be together for the conference this week, but um, I really appreciate you all joining me in this alternative format. I want to kick things off by uh, defining crowdsourcing to the best of my ability. Um, I want to be explicitly clear here that the, the two definitions that I've included in this slide are both uh, definitions of um, that are more in line with, with research-focused crowdsourcing. Uh, the term crowdsourcing has a lot of roots in a business model. Um, so Jeff Howe and his editor um, first used this in a 2006 Wired magazine article. Um, and it's specifically a, a sort of portmanteau of the words crowd and outsourcing. So the idea being uh, a function that was once performed by employees is outsourced to a crowd of people. But for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm using a definition that maps much more closely to the first one on the slide, so Hedges and Dunn. Um, which is simply the process of leveraging public participation in or contributions to projects and activities. And we can apply this concept to cultural heritage uh, projects in a number of ways. Um, so thinking about things like data transformation tasks, such as transcribing text or meta metadata enhancement through tagging images. Before I get um, further into the cultural heritage applications for crowdsourcing, I want to take a step back and introduce you to the Zooniverse and tell you a little bit about how our projects work. Zooniverse is an online platform that facilitates uh, this type of crowdsourcing for teams and individuals who want to use it to support research. And we refer to ourselves as a platform for people-powered research. We host a number of projects which invite volunteers to help research teams process their data. And the platform is maintained by a team of developers and researchers based at Oxford University, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, and the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Since the platform launched in 2009, uh, just over 2 million registered volunteers have cumulatively produced more than 250 million classifications. The way that Zooniverse projects work is that for each project, multiple volunteers will interact with an image, video, or audio clip known as a subject, and then engage in a task or series of tasks based on that particular subject. Once the project is done, the researchers carry out their data analysis and they then share their results with the public. And I want to note here that uh, one of the stipulations of hosting a project on the Zooniverse platform uh, is that you do have to agree to make your results public um, within two years of your project being finished. And the idea behind that is that uh, if you are inviting the public to help you with your research, you owe it to them to make sure that they can access those research results. Um, so that's a, a general uh, tenet of the platform. Oop, there we go. To illustrate how projects on this universe look to volunteers, I have included a screenshot here from a currently active project called Mapping Historic Skies, um, which invites volunteers to engage with the Adler Planetarium's collection of celestial cartography. And in this particular workflow, volunteers draw boxes around individual constellations. You can see these green boxes here. Um, and these individual constellations will then be cropped into individual images and um, 
we are hoping will eventually be used to compare artistic depictions of constellations across time and geographic location. So the ultimate goal is to create a massive database of constellation images. So someone can say, I would like to um, see all of the images of Orion from this range of 200 years and then be able to compare how they were depicted. So on the left of the screen, you see the large box with the subject image. Um, that is the piece of data that volunteers are engaging with. And then on the right uh, is the instructions and the tools which allow the volunteers to complete the required task. And then there's also a tab that says tutorial. Uh, the first time you visit a project, the tutorial will pop up automatically, um, but it will remain there in case you need a refresher. And that's true of every project builder project on the platform. Here is another example from the classification interface. It is the, a project that invites volunteers to help transcribe the enlistment records of African-American soldiers during the U.S. Civil War. So again, you'll see the subject is shown on the left-hand side and the task is shown on the right. And this example uh, asks volunteers to input text information, while the last example was a drawing task. And these are just two examples of a, of a wide variety of tasks that volunteers can, can choose to participate in on the Zooniverse platform, depending on their interests. Both of these projects were made possible through the use of a tool called the Project Builder, which allows anyone in the world to create a project like the ones you've just seen absolutely free of charge. All you need is a Zooniverse account, which you can sign up for with your email address and your name, um, and an internet connection, and a data set. So this is an example of the Project Builder interface, uh, or really what a research team member sees when they are building their project. And as you can see, it's a fairly straightforward user interface. You simply move through the tabs on the left-hand side, um, they're in blue. And these allow you to do things like add content, uh, add team members to your project, upload data, export your results, um, set up your message boards, a number of different things, add pictures. It's a really uh, rich interface. And I've included the URL at the bottom of this slide. It's https colon backslash backslash www.zooniverse.org slash lab. I want to share some common tasks that cultural heritage organizations tend to engage in with their data. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but I think it's a pretty good overview in terms of just the range of possibility um, that's open to people who want to incorporate crowdsourcing into their institution. So certainly the most popular task type is text transcription. Um, which is unsurprising given the overwhelming amount of digitized images of text that exist in the world, but which cannot easily be searched. So transcribing that text puts it into an easily searchable, accessible format. Metadata enhancement is also quite popular, um, but that process can, can look quite different depending on the aims of the institution. It can include things like image tagging, transcribing, or even writing short descriptions of images to be used in catalog. Similarly, categorization and classification is a popular task type, so that kind of involves inviting volunteers to choose a specific category or option that might best represent an image. OCR verification is also growing in popularity as optical character recognition still often requires quite a lot of quality control. Um, and depending on the needs of the project, this process can be as simple as a yes or no question for determining whether an OCR um, process was successful. Or it can also involve volunteers being asked to retranscribe bits of text that were um, not successfully able to be OCR'd. If 
finally, I've included content identification here as it's becoming quite popular among archives in particular, particularly um, with photography collections. And this can often be um, quite niche. Sometimes um, the success of a project like that is dependent upon finding specific stakeholders. So for example, um, people who lived in the community that houses the photo archive. Um, but we're also um, doing something like this with the Mapping Historic Skies project that I showed you a few slides back. Um, so after the celestial cartography images are cropped, we ask volunteers in a separate workflow to identify the constellation either by name if they know it or um, through answering a series of questions that help them narrow down to one or two um, options so that they can make a, an educated guess based on the image. We are a primarily grant funded group and many of our um, funded efforts involve creating new tools. Um, these are typically for use in a specific project based on need. If we don't have a tool and we need it, we'll partner with a team um, to create this bespoke tool, which we will then generalize and include in the Project Builder Toolkit so that uh, anyone can use it for free. So I wanted to just give you a sense of our current efforts and the types of tools that are being funded right now. Um, I'll note here that we do receive funding from a range of agencies, and while the tools we develop are often part of discipline-specific efforts, many of the tools end up being used by project builders from a range of research disciplines. So for example, um, so far our text tools have been primarily funded by humanities-focused research agencies, but they're also really frequently used by researchers working in other fields like natural sciences or, or um, social sciences. Uh, they really aren't just impacting researchers within a specific discipline. We work with hundreds of research teams around the world, and one great result of working with so many global teams and continually being able to work on new tools and updates is that we have been consistently able to increase the rates and volumes of data that are being produced through Zooniverse projects, which then um, leads to an increase in the number of research teams that want to build crowdsourcing projects. And that first big spike that you see um, big jump in project numbers uh, was a result of the Project Builder launching in July of 2015. Since 2009, we've launched more than 200 projects, 97 of which are currently live at zooniverse.org slash projects. And we've been averaging one new project launch per week since 2017. We are always working on updates to our infrastructure um, and building out the type of tools that are available on the Project Builder. So I want to give you a sort of quick preview of some of the things that are coming down the pipeline, particularly those that are related to um, digital humanities and, and cultural heritage projects. The first is called Alice. Uh, Alice is a brand new tool that we're about to launch that will allow teams to view and collaboratively edit the results of transcription projects built on the Zooniverse platform. And it stands for Aggregate Line Inspector and Collaborative Editor. I'm really excited about this tool. Um, we built this because we noticed that research teams were having a very difficult time working with text output from transcription projects. Um, as you may recall, the way that Zooniverse projects work uh, means that multiple people are transcribing the same thing several times, and then you have to aggregate those results to determine what the consensus transcription is. When you're working with strings of text, it's much harder to determine consensus than it is for, say, a yes or no question. That's much more straightforward. So text is really difficult to work with. Um, and so we created this tool, which supports automated text aggregation um, and allows teams to review and approve their transcriptions before they export their data. 
Um, this will also allow for multiple types of data download um, depending on what you need to use the data for. So for example, if I'm just trying to read a piece of text, I would likely choose a text file rather than something like a JSON blob. And here is just a preview of what that interface will look like. Translations are fairly new on this universe, but we're really excited about the amount of interest we're already seeing from teams who want to translate their projects or also from uh, volunteers who want to help out project teams as translators so that their projects can be accessible to more communities around the world. So the collaborators tab of the project builder allows you to add anyone in a translator role that can be an internal team member or a volunteer from your community. Um, that translator can then log in through translations.zooniverse.org and translate the project. Once it is completed and enabled, uh, the volunteer can then make their language selection via a drop down menu on the project's home page. And that is an example of a translated project. This is the Spanish version of one of our most popular projects, Penguin Watch, which is an ecology project that invites participation participants to uh, count penguins for science. Um, it's really quite lovely. You get to see some pretty cool pictures of penguins. So um, if you've got a spare moment and want to see very cute pictures of penguins, um, I highly recommend visiting penguinwatch.org. And it's been translated, I think, into a number of languages. Um, so that is also worth exploring as an example of a translated Zooniverse project. Machine learning integration is another method that can help to optimize the class classification process and make the best possible use of limited volunteer time. So we've had some projects already incorporate automated processes into their projects, but that has mostly been in the fields of astrophysics and ecology. It's still fairly new for cultural heritage projects. One thing we are hoping to start soon is a project that will allow us to create a prototype for incorporating handwritten text recognition into Zooniverse projects. So the idea is that we will train a model based on crowdsource transcription data from an existing Zooniverse project, and then um, we'll create a new project where volunteers can verify or correct machine transcriptions rather than starting from scratch. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what our volunteers prefer here. So remember, just because a method is more efficient doesn't always mean it's going to be a better experience for your volunteers. So as these new methods um, arise and sort of grow in popularity, um, I do think it's important for project leads and practitioners to be taking that step back and saying, okay, just because we can do this doesn't always mean that we should. Um, it's a really good case for involving volunteers in your decision-making process, um, spending a lot of time on project message boards, making sure to keep your thumb to the pulse of your community um, to make sure that, that they are still benefiting from the project as well. Which leads me to uh, my last point. I want to talk about my unbreakable rules of crowdsourcing. Um, I, I want to also make a point to sort of include these, um, these rules or suggestions um, whilst also acknowledging the effects of COVID-19 on the Zooniverse platform as well as our communities. So many institutions around the world are now trying to accommodate remote working environments as well as to create online experiences for their communities. And for many of these institutions, crowdsourcing is often seen as an efficient, financially low risk option. And because of this, our rates of participation have tripled in the past few months and we are seeing a major increase in communication 
from research teams and institutions who are hoping to make use of the project builder. And that is, that is great in theory. Um, and, um, but I, I do want to be clear, something that I've been really trying to communicate, um, especially to those who are newly interested in crowdsourcing as a result of COVID closures, um, is that it's really important for this process to be intentional, even if you are doing it or exploring it as a result of institutional closure. And the rules that I've included here may seem quite obvious, but I cannot stress enough they're important. So I'm just going to read through this slide um, and make a few final points um, before ending. So the first unbreakable rule of crowdsourcing is people forward thinking. It's really important that you're keeping your volunteers in your mind at all times. Um, a really nice feature of the project builder is that you can preview your project at any point during your um, process of building it. Um, I also really recommend uh, participating in as many projects as you can before taking the step of creating your own project. Because if you don't know what it's like to be a volunteer on a crowdsourcing project, you will not be an effective leader. The second unbreakable rule is don't waste volunteer time. You need to have a plan for how you're going to use your data before you launch your project. There's nothing more disappointing than a, a project that um, completes gathering data from volunteers and then realizes that they, they don't know how to use it or it's not in the right format. Um, again, another feature of the project builder is that you can export data at any time. So I really caution people to export data early and often to make sure that they have the resources that they need to work with the output before they involve the public. The last one is to always experiment and iterate. Um, as you may, as you may uh, have guessed <laughs> based on the first two rules, this is also a feature of the project builder. Um, you can change things at any time. Um, and this process of iterating based on feedback will absolutely make your project better. Um, I have never seen a project get worse when they made changes based on feedback from their community. So the overview of, of these unbreakable rules is really to take your time and be intentional in your choices. If you rush this process, you will almost certainly be sacrificing one of these three things um, in order to produce a project quickly. Um, so just something to really keep in mind um, as you explore the possibility of crowdsourcing. That's about all I have for today. I have included our um, outreach email address please feel free to email us with questions or to set up a meeting. Um, I've also included a link to our GitHub repo. All of our code is open source, so do feel free to, to take a peek. Um, and I've also included my email um, if you have specific questions about this talk, um, but I do ask that any Zooniverse general related emails, please go to that contact at um, address. This has been really lovely. Um, thank you very much again for watching and listening. And thank you to the University of Gothenburg for organizing um, this conference. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.